Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And welcome back to the Realist Podcast in the Dunya, the three Muslims. Today we're joined with the man himself, the Sunnah man or the Sunnah guy. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Damn, bro, got my name wrong in the first five seconds. <laughs> forgive me, bro. Forgive me. <laughs> Alhamdulillah, man. How are you? You're good. All Alhamdulillah. All is well, man, mashallah. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. All right, man, I'm not going to get over your setup, bro. I keep looking at it. It's just like, wow, it's fun. Like, even like it being cut off so much, I'm like, Allahumma barak, bro. It looks so nice. You know, it, it wasn't actually me, bro. It was actually um, a friend of mine who set, who, who made the setup for me. Yeah. And then once he kind of laid the foundation, I just started like building on it. So I built the lights and stuff like that. Fun, man. But yeah, Allahumma man, I, as I said, that's, that's the perks of being a filmmaker, bro. So it's nice, man. It's a, and plus, you know, when you're editing all day, like, you need to have like a den. You need like a man cave. You need something that looks vibey, like a, a nice cozy place. You know what I mean, bro? So yeah, that's yeah. Alhamdulillah, I have like a six by six little like office. <laughs> I made it myself, though. Alhamdulillah. Bro, you you could do a lot with that as well, man. It, it's all about what you can do with your space. Do you know what I mean? Like as yeah. in that, that's the most important thing. The vibe is real, bro. You need ambience. You need something nice to kind of focus and concentrate. Well, for me anyway. Yeah, yeah, one hundred percent, one hundred percent. We got brother Zachary saying Rami. <laughs> better, man. Allah bless you, bro. Uh, how how does this work? So people just pop up with their like chats and stuff. Yeah, so there's a whole comment section to uh to the side. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if you'll see it, but to the side here, and okay. um, I like when someone sends, I'll just pull it up here for us, so we don't get yeah. any of the bad ones, <clears throat> inshallah. But you you mentioned you're a filmmaker, right? Yes, bro. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I'm I'm interested about that because I think filmmaking, especially for Muslims, is very powerful because I'm actually taking a course. I feel like every time I talk, I mention I'm taking a course related to this topic. So it seems like I'm taking 50 different courses, but um, I'm taking a course on culture and media. And they talk a lot about how films like there was a film, man, I, a few decades ago, I forget when, but a while ago, and I actually re revived the 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 triple k because i don't want to say the full thing you know the wow. white group it revived them just based on the cinematography the innovations they made and and the way it was filmed so media is is powerful so allahumma barak i, I want to hear what you have to say about media and how you got into it and what you think I, it can do for muslims absolutely bro absolutely so firstly um firstly thank you for for, for inviting me on here um jazakallah brothers for having me here i pray that allah Brings uh, bears this this gathering this uh, this live stream this video bears uh, righteous fruits inshallah. So um, okay, filmmaking and media in general. Basically, this is something that I'm extremely passionate about because when it comes to uh, media, this is the voice of the masses, right? This is the this is the the tool and this is the poetry. Uh, like the poetry of the Arabs is like the media of today, the film the filmmaking of today, the rappers, the filmmakers, the whole media industry. Muslims, I feel, have not even utilized it 1%. I feel that we have totally just said, like, you know, it's like when the printing press happened and the West were creating uh, books and they were printing books. The Muslims were behind for over 100 years. We just lagged and lagged and lagged. And they went so far ahead. And then we like, okay, you know what? Let's just let's, let's start doing it now. Because there was so much fatawa and so many things that were just holding people back, holding people back. You can't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. And then, subhanAllah, you know, we realized that the innovation of the West, it trumped and the, and they kind of, that's when the Renaissance happened where they were all kind of like flying now, that like as in they were, they were moving forward. So we should take a lesson from history and that is that when it comes to media, we have not touched the surface whatsoever. And there's always going to be problems, there's always going to be issues, especially with media, especially working in media, how you portray, what you portray, what to use, vocal only beats, etc. Women with hijab, not, there's so many different nuances there that, you know, uh, again, you know, can I guess be bottlenecks, but I feel that it's a tool that we have to master now. And if we truly master this, not only in this day and age will we leave a legacy behind, like you have to understand that, sorry, what, what I want to say was, not only will we benefit the people, but we will also leave a legacy behind for those who get to watch our content for the future as well. And so the way it all started for me was um, I watched uh, The Avengers the Avengers movie, right? And I don't, I don't watch movies, but this was in COVID, and this was basically in 2020. I watched Endgame, and I haven't seen any of the Avengers movie. Mm. 
and I was watching it and like, you know, because like we were in Ramadan, my brother just put it on and like, you know, passing time throughout the day and then it was Eid and, you know, we just sat at home all day. And I see Spider-Man, I see Hulk, I see Iron Man. I'm like, well, what the hell is this, man? Like, this is like the biggest collection of like superheroes. What's going on? And I watched it and I was like, hold on, let me watch it from the start, man. So then I'm from 2008 Iron Man. Like, literally, I binged every single Avengers movie. And when I came to the end of it, I was like, bro, this, I don't know what's happened to me. This is like changed me, man. I don't know how it's changed me, but I feel emotional. Like, as in, I'm so drawn, I'm so drawn in. And subhanAllah, from there, I realized that we have to do something when it comes to media. And so that's when I started my YouTube channel, which was in 2020. And uh, I started making short films. And Alhamdulillah, after making about eight, nine short films, I then uh, made my first professional film. Uh, Alhamdulillah, it was released in cinemas in the UK as well. So it was a, uh, it was the first Islamic film in the UK to be shown in cinemas, alhamdulillah. So it was uh, it happened very fast because, again, in COVID, you're just sat at home, you're not doing anything. And uh, because I had the advantage of, like, no one going outside and the lockdown and everything, I just honed in on the skill and just kind of, yeah, man, just developed it and just kind of uh, used it to my advantage. And then obviously now, like, now the film has finished and I'm now just focused on kind of creating content online. And I've got a few other things in the pipeline as well. But wallahi, bro, media is something that I feel that Muslims have to take advantage of and they have to utilize to the best of their ability because it is the voice of the future, bro. And if we don't control this space, and if we don't have our presence in this space, we will get drowned out. And wallahi, when I look at the du'at and I look at the, the kind of da'wah scene, I just, see, I just feel that what we need to really do is to drown this space out and to drown out the noise of evil, of fahsha, of, of, of immorality, because that is so loud and so prominent that we, I feel we are falling asleep on on the biggest thing, and that is media, bro. We have to we have to be in this space, bro. Allah, that, that's, I, I truly, I'm, as you can tell, I'm very passionate about that, bro. Allahumma barik, Allahumma barik. What, what's, your, uh, what's your movie called? My movie is called Two Sides. So, Two Sides. Uh, Two sides. The trailers on my YouTube channel, and uh, and so sorry, bro. Bro, was that your movie? Yeah, I made the movie. Oh, I'm the director. I know, bro. I've heard about it, of course. Really? Okay, okay, mashallah. Yeah, mashallah. Allah yeah, yeah. So Allah two sides. I, 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 I'm, I'm the director of two sides. I wrote it, uh, and alhamdulillah, bro. It was, um, yeah, man. It was, it was emotional, bro. It was, it was, it was good, man. Subhanallah. We had, imagine, imagine, bro. You got, you got like, you know, thousands, uh, like. So in our premiere, we had about a thousand people turn up. So there were two uh, different sh screenings of like 500 people each. And imagine like, the whole cinema is packed. And like, subhanAllah, you've got the Quran being recited in the cinema. You've got Allah's name being mentioned. And like, uh, and the, the craziest thing was, is that in front of the big silver screen, like we had a jama'ah of like two, 250 people there, bro. And it was like, subhanAllah, people were looking at it like, this is the first time since cinemas have been around in the West that Muslims have actually had the chance to go in and, actually like dominate this place and just kind of have Allah dhikr there and it was a very proud moment bro so alhamdulillah man yeah that that was uh that was great man and it was probably the biggest project i've ever done alhamdulillah do you uh mashallah do you know brother uh, gabriel al-romani yeah yeah yeah, I, yeah I, so I've seen... I was in i was in dubai with him a few months ago and we were just you know on a late night drive and he was telling me you know what the biggest problem is in the dao scene i was like what he was like there's no one doing proper professional content and I didn't really take him seriously back then. You know what I mean? Because, you know, me, Rami, we turn on the camera, bro, in our homes. You know, we just talk, chop it up on the on the three Muslims. But he was saying there's no one taking, like, proper, like, mirrorless cameras, going outside, professional mics, lighting, and doing that real type of Netflix, Hollywood type content, you know? Yeah, yeah. For, like, the Muslim equivalent. And he, yeah. he was saying that that's, there's a huge reason when people opt in for, like, a lot of the things that you're saying. They choose that because there's that cutting edge technology, you know what I mean? But when it's the Muslims, they don't really have that. So he was saying, we got to bring that back. 100%. Wallahi, 100%, bro. I, I agree with him. There are attempts, like, like don't get me wrong, like One Path Network, uh, you've got Buna Muhammad as well, who's doing his thing in, in Canada as well. And like, there's, there's stuff, but I just feel that the, the problem is, is that all that stuff is, um, it's all privatized. And that's why it ends up happening. You get a private label, and people do it for a business reason. They do it for kind of a an income generating opportunity as well. Not not necessarily like kind of like one path because they've got a big pool of funds anyway. But like, what ends up happening is that it just doesn't go online. It just doesn't get shown to people. And the vision of two sides was to eventually release it online. So we will stream it for a while, inshallah. But then we want to leave it, put it online for the Muslims to see in like indefinitely kind of thing. So. I agree. This space is like it's it's bro. It's it's barren, bro. And like it's it. There's no one here. 
but at the same time it's fertile land bro like literally if you enter this space you will get traction like very very quickly with two sides we realize bro there's so much traction so much traction so many people are like like they they, they showed up bro. We, bro we were shocked when we had a thousand people turn up to the premiere because we're nobody like we criterion studios is, is my is my company uh, it's a film production studio and we are nobodies. We don't have a big celebrity daddy that's going to come promote things. We are no one. We just came out of nowhere. And Alhamdulillah, bro, we, we put on an event with a thousand people, bro. Alhamdulillah, we sold out in seven different cinemas, that, the seven different screenings that we had. We sold out, bro. And that was the most amazing thing. Alhamdulillah. Mashallah, to work, Allah. Alhamdulillah, man. So, Allah. yeah, man, that, that was a great journey, man. Alhamdulillah. That was very beautiful. Allah, barik, bro. May Allah bless you and give you the strength to keep going. Allahumma, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, we have brother Araf here. He's a fan. He's saying, I'm actually stumbling upon some of the guys' IG page accidentally. Uh, but Alhamdulillah, the content is so nice and real that it's hard for me to not follow your IG. Keep it up. Thank you, bro. Allahumma, very beautiful, very beautiful. Um, nice so, one, I want to ask more about. Uh, media i don't want to get into the specifics of you know how you shoot certain things what kind of shots affect people how they affect people but i do want to know are you ever going to make a video like that for muslims educating them on how to get started with this field i mean that is one of my aims with my own youtube channel as well is that i feel so so you know when like you come on youtube like you feel that like you have to do things a certain way. And then I'm, I'm slowly getting more into my personality. I'm slowly like as in being uh, like sharing the things that I feel passionate about, etc. One of them is filmmaking, inshallah. And my plan is to help uh, Muslim content creators. You know, the only problem with that, though, is I find there's a lot of Muslim like videographers, cinematographers. But bro, they're all doing stuff that's haram. Like they're all involved in music. They're all involved in like drama series with women and nudity and stuff. And it's like... Even even young brothers who are like upcoming filmmakers, you know, they're doing shoots and they're doing edits and it's like there's music in there and there's like, you know, women being on the screen. And and so really and truly, bro, it's like selling headphones, isn't it? You know, you know, when you sell headphones, um, you know that not everyone's going to listen to Quran. So so there's a gray area there. So teaching filmmaking, I'd love to do it, but I'd love to do it with a caveat. And that is that people make a vow not to do anything haram. So I've got this young filmmaker in my area. Uh, he's 16, 17 years old. And we were just fundraising for a camera. And alhamdulillah, we managed to raise the funds within a day. Alhamdulillah, it's great, right? And he, I've been observing him for the past six months. And I said to him, if you want my help, if you want me to help you, then I don't want to see you making anything haram. Because he got, he got, he took my camera and he started making adverts. And in there, they had like music in there. And I was like, bro, what's going on, man? You're using my camera. And then I took my camera back off him. And like... He didn't like that. I know he didn't like it because my, because like he was he was using my camera, right? And so what ended up happening is, he said, uh, like you know, bro, can I use the camera? I like, no, bro, I'm trying to sell it, bro. Sorry, man. So, so what ended up, so what ended up happening is I had to make an excuse, and then eventually I sat him down and I said to him, look, the reason why I took the camera off you was because, bro, you started using music and you started doing these things, and I did tell you not to do that, but you went ahead and did it. And subhanAllah, he realized that what well, his mistake. He made repentance and then after that, you know, he's been by my side and he's been creating content. He's been using vocal only stuff and he's been using, he's not doing anything haram and like that. So then I'm like, all right, you're ready now. So then I raised money for to get him a camera. Alhamdulillah, he's got his camera now. So inshallah, like now I'm teaching him. But because I have control over that, you know, if you just put a video out teaching people how to do transitions and edits and how to direct things and write scripts and stuff like that, you don't know who's watching. So imagine if someone watches it and they use that tool that I've taught them to do something evil. It's something that is playing with me a little bit. And maybe I need to speak to my teachers and find out exactly what's the best way to do it. Maybe a private course, etc. for Muslims. I don't know. Let's see, man. Let's see, inshallah. Inshallah, inshallah. Allahumma barak. And that was my first thought because, you know, the same way Muslims can, can go to non-Muslims and see what they're doing and, you know, take it and do good with it. Same thing with Muslims. They could take what Muslims are doing and switch it up and do bad with it, which they have in the past, unfortunately. Absolutely. But. Alhamdulillah, may Allah bless you, Allahumma barik, because it's, it's always Thank good for, for young people to have mentors, people they can look up to. So to have someone so local, you know, Allahumma barik, I think that's that's beautiful. So that kind of leads me to my next question, which is you growing up as a young lad in the UK, you know, you say that you've been living there your whole life, Allahumma barik. Were you always practicing? Did you always have this dream of making films for Muslims? Or was there a point where you were pulled back to the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? 
so um so when it comes to the filmmaking that's a very recent thing even up until two and a half years ago i didn't even know i was going to be a filmmaker right but uh, i've kind of just kind of transitioned to that myself but in essence bro when it comes to my whole kind of practicing journey alhamdulillah bro it's coming up to 13 years now um and i started very young my dad was like a strict deobandi hanafi kind of you know like father and that kind of pushed me away from the dean because the dean was very boring for me from the age of like 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. It was just like, it was just a chore, bro, because my dad, like he was practicing fresh as well. Um, and so he was practicing for a couple of years and then I became a teenager. And for him, the whole, he had a lot of zeal as well. And when I was, as fathers, when you have a lot of zeal, what ends up happening is you kind of push your son into a certain direction. And it was, it, it was a bit lousy from him, right? You know, just to be honest, right? Is the fact that, he was he just saw only one thing madrasa go to madrasa no music you know like he, he was proper proper hardcore and that pushed me away bro so from in secondary school i unfortunately i'm not gonna go into details but unfortunately i did mess around and um and i kind of felt that you know i was always had this mindset when i'm 25 30 go off for uni go hajj blah 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 this and that right and so I said, let me take advantage of like all the jahiliya now. Like, let me just do as much as I can. So I tried, I did more than the average person. And I went, unfortunately, really bad. And uh, sadly, bro, you know, I, my, my kind of experiences with, with, with girls and uh, with music and with other things, etc. Just general vices that as young people you have, right? As a teenager growing up, you know. Um, and I, I then, subhanAllah, I, I then ha- was in a haram relationship with a non-Muslim. And I kind of, I wanted to marry her. And what ended up happening, bro, was that subhanAllah, you know, at this point, by the way, I would say, I would go to the extent of saying that I was probably either borderline monafic or probably like agnostic or something like that, right? Just because of the fact that like my dad would tell me to pray and I would like splash water on my face and go upstairs and I'm like, yeah, I'm going to pray and then just go back to sleep for Fajr. Like as in it was just, it was just like, because it's just to do it for my father, that was it. Uh, so I understand the struggle of a lot of young Muslims as well who are living double lives. I really, really get that pressure, right? And so when it came to me, my mom, subhanAllah, she caught me speaking to this girl. And uh, I said, mom, what do you know about love? Blah, blah, blah. That's not, you know, just getting emotional and just like, throwing my toys out of the pram. And uh, basically, mom and dad weren't having it. And they kind of like, you know, said, no, you're not going to do it. You're not going to get married to her. She's not a Muslim, blah, blah, blah. And she's like, why are we even discussing this? You're only 15, man. You're only 16. Like... What, what the hell are you, are you going to do getting married right now? Are we going to keep her blah, blah, blah? Anyway, bro, I, I, I then said to myself, I'm going to convert this girl to Islam, <laughs> right? So uh, I was, and I wasn't even practicing myself, right? So she was a Hindu. And so what I did was I went on Google and I typed in how to convert Hindu to Islam. And then guess who pops up? The first person that pops up is Dr. Zakir Naik, right? <laughs> so Masha, the legend, Dr. Zakir Naik, he pops up. And this is when he was quite popular, 2008, 10, like, you know, that was when he was, like, really popular, Peace TV and stuff. And, bro, he's like, you know, like, he's like, you know, bro, that's a very good question. And, like, you know, like, and then he would just fire away, fire away, bro. He'd be like, you know, chapter number this, verse number this. And, subhanAllah, for the first time in my life, for the first time in my life, subhanAllah, I thought to myself, this religion, it holds value, man. Whoa, like, is, is there actually evidence for this stuff? I didn't know this. So subhanAllah, the Qur'an that had dust on my shelves, bro, like I picked that up for the first time and I started reading it, subhanAllah. And um, and bro, ever since then, you know, subhanAllah, man, like, you know. Hey, Samakim, bro. <laughs> Wa alaikum as Please forgive me. 30 bro. minutes, bro. 30 minutes. Uh, listen, 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 bro. It's not even like that. Uh, number one, I completely forgot. That's the thing. <laughs> and number two, I wasn't even, I wasn't home, bro. So like, I just got back right now, so forgive me. Okay. I'm here. Yeah, no, I'm bro, you, came at the, you came at the perfect time. Came I, was at the perfect time yeah. I was getting okay. emotional, bro. You stopped me, Alhamdulillah, man. So it's good. Ah, uh, Alhamdulillah, bro. Go ahead, though. Go ahead, get emotional. No worries, no worries. So, yeah, so anyway, I picked the Quran up, and ever since then, subhanAllah, like I made a vow to Allah, I said, Ya Allah, I'm never going to miss a single prayer. And yes, yeah, subhanAllah, man. So it was February, March of 2010. And uh, ever since then, bro, it just, I've been practicing. And a, a very interesting thing, subhanAllah, was like, because Dr. Zakir Naik was my inspiration to come to the deen, uh, he is very big on da'wah. And so then I started watching him, Yusuf Estes, Abdurrahim Green, etc. on Peace TV. Like, I, like, you know how you just binge watch people? I was just binge watching Peace TV. And, um, and subhanAllah, they're very big on da'wah, on spreading Islam. 
And so I was playing uh, like academy level football in the UK at the time. And I was the only Pakistani with like 45 other non-Muslims. Yeah. And I start, and every single one of them, I gave them the full message of Islam. But none of them accepted it because it was just me speaking to the crowd and speaking to them. And, you know, they were just football and lads culture in the UK is ridiculously toxic. Literally, it's like this. On Monday, Tuesday, you speak about what you did with a girl on the weekend. On Wednesday, you take a break. And on Thursday, Friday, you speak about what you're going to do with the girl on the weekend. And it's so horrible, bro. The lads culture is kind of... Oh, like football lads kind of culture in the UK is horrible. So imagine trying to give da'wah to them. My first biggest test of da'wah was the hardest, bro. Well, like to this day, I've never given da'wah to more stubborn, arrogant and horrible people in my life. And so because that was my first test, anything after that was easy, bro. So ever since then, bro, the, the kind of spark and the desire to spread Islam has always been in my heart because it was the thing that brought me to Islam. Right. And uh, and yeah, bro, like subhanAllah, that's that was my journey. And then Alhamdulillah, ever since then, bro, I've, I've never kind of stopped when it comes to kind of uh, giving that one stuff like that. I've been through my own tests with doubts and with with shubuhat and problems. But bro, in essence, Alhamdulillah, man, like, you know, the whole journey has been very, very blessed. Bro. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed me. And as you grow older, you mature. You know, the things that you 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 made mistakes with, you you correct them, you correct them as you get older. But bro, Alhamdulillah, yeah, man, I had it. I had it. I had it bit of a bad past when I was younger, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was the one that guides and brings me to the light, man. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. I feel like I'm talking too much. Is is this... No, is, no, is no. This... No, bro, you're good. I mean, you're, you're, good. good. Yeah, you're telling a story, bro, so it yeah. should be like that. Allahumma barik, bro. If you have any questions for us, feel free, you know, to, to jump at it. No worries, inshallah. Yeah, no, no, no. 100% inshallah, man. I'll, I'll definitely ask you guys a question, man. But, Allahumma yeah, barik, bro. So that's what it is, man. Allah, bro. That's uh, essentially, bro. That's the kind of journey I've been on. When we when we see a lot of the segments, on, like the recent videos and reels on, like, you know, Instagram and shorts or TikTok, there's a lot of stuff you're talking about with, like, the family unit and marriage and masculinity and that type of stuff. So my question to you is, like why do you think this is an extremely important thing for us to talk about because a lot of people dm us they're like why do you guys keep talking about this why is it mm. why is it always about marriage and the family unit you know um so i've had the pleasure of kind of living through the kind of uh, the that was seen from 2000 and so i was by the way i've always been involved with that one so i've always observed what's happening the kind of uh, i keep an ear to the ground as they say right and i've seen this crazy transition that in, in, in terms of kind of uh, female strength, female power, fe feminism, etc., all this sort of stuff. And I've seen things that were not tolerated 10, 12 years ago that are tolerated now and actually paraded and promoted now. And me, OC, I'm, I'm just shy of 30. I'm 28, right? And like, I'm seeing this and I'm like thinking to myself, subhanAllah, this is, this is kind of crazy. Man. This, is, this is mad. Like, what's actually happening? And so I actually... I actually got married from Pakistan. I actually went back home to get married, right? And I've taken a very traditional route that a lot of people generally wouldn't do. And because I've done that, I've kind of, alhamdulillah, like, you know, people ask me, they say, how are you able to, you know, uh, run multiple businesses, make a film, and like, you know, and yet you don't have a job, like, you know, <laughs> like, like you, you kind of, people, people wonder how I have so much time. And I say, wallahi, the reason I have so much time is because of my wife. She does her role very well, which is look after the kids. She makes my food. And wallahi, I'm not shy to say this at all. She cooks my food, makes my food, looks after the kids. And then when it's my time to come and inspire and help and be with them, it's there. But I don't have the role of now it's your day. Now it's your turn. It's your three hours now while I go to my girls and I tell kind of thing. And I, subhanAllah, I see how that dynamic is so successful. Right. And may Allah allow us to continue to be successful because Wallahi, bro, I'm no expert in marriage. That's it. I'm not expert. I'm not an expert. It's just the fact that I can only speak about my experiences and what I've observed. Now, then I look at some dynamics of my friends. And by the way, when I say my friends, right, um, that that what you see online, which is like the TikToks, Reels, YouTube, whatever, etc. That's five percent of what actually happens in my life. 95% of it is on the ground with the brothers in my own local town. And because I have the opportunity to spend time with a lot of young brothers, I always spend time with young, young brothers. When it comes to young, I mean like, you know, 23 and below. Because I like to kind of help 
bring up the next generation in terms of give them that mindset and help them come on board. And we have a very strong brotherhood in our local town as well. So I see their problem and I see their dilemmas and I see their issues and sticking points. And I see the, 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 the pitfalls that they have when looking for marriage. And I'm seeing why is this happening? And that's why when I speak about certain things, it's not just out of thin air. It's number one, relaying my experiences and the experiences of other brothers who have had successful marriages and then kind of contrasting that with the young millennial generation that is growing up and the pitfalls that they are having, getting married quickly, getting divorced quickly, not being able to find someone suitable and then, you know, uh, like staying unmarried for, for, for a long time. And then when you do get with someone, all these problems that happen. And I'm thinking, subhanAllah, like, why is this happening? And then I realized, you know what? The reality is, you look at our elders, you look at our parents, you look at our grandparents, stable home. Generally speaking, I obviously, bro, you have the, have the odd, like, you know, uh, like broken home, whatever, here and there. Stable marriages. They stay together. Good family unit. Solid values. Right? And, and, and people say, oh, yeah, they're just together because of the kids or whatever. But let me tell you something. You know, subhanAllah, bro, yeah? The reality is, is that the direction that we are going in, bro, in terms of our, our, ourselves as a generation, and in terms of where our direction is going, in terms of morality, you, you can see the flawed uh, nature of, of, of what we are living in right now, the society we're living in. You can see the flaws in it. You see it's full of holes, bro. And so therefore, we have no right to claim and say that what we are doing and what we are living through is correct. We have to look at those who have come before us who have successful marriages. And that's why I always promote, be good, respecting your parents, listen to your elders. If you want to take marriage advice, go and listen to them. Go and find out what they say. And wallahi, if we do not live with our elders and with our with, with our shuyukh and with our teachers, and if we have no one to keep us grounded, bro, wallahi, bro, who the hell are we to actually give advice to people? We are living through the same crap of social media that these youngsters are living through. The people that have had a clean upbringing are the ones older than us. And therefore, when I say to listen to them and more, be more traditional, it's not because I'm just saying do that. It's because their model has worked and ours is failing miserably. And so therefore, does it not just make sense to listen to them or just give them an ear and, and give them a few seconds and understand what they're trying to tell you? So when I put these things out, bro, it's not because, oh, I'm just trying to, you know, get one over the youngsters or whatever. No, wallahi, all of my friendship circles, about 80, 90, 100 of us, whatever, all of them, they all are younger than me, most of the majority, right? And they all listen to my advice and they understand it. And we talk about these things in our gatherings all the time. But the reality is, is that locker room talk with brothers never comes online. That's the problem. Because I feel that the mashayikh, they want to win points with the sisters. And so what we find is that that locker room talk, that chat that brothers have by themselves, with themselves, when they're sitting down, right, over some kahwa or whatever, bro. They're chilling and talking. No one is bringing that to the fore. So sisters really don't get to understand what is going through the brother's psyche, what is going through their mind, what, what, what problems they're going through, what their thought process is. And so what ends up happening is sisters have this fantasy world that they're living in. And then the brothers are just listening to Mashaikh saying, brother, bend over backwards and, and you know what I mean? Listen to your wife. And if you if she moves to the right, you move to the right. If she does this, you do that. And the sisters are like, oh my God, I love this Sheikh. Amazing. And then all of a sudden, bro, you have a mismatch where a brother's trying to live through his true masculinity and his true nature as a man. And he wants to be the king of the house. But then you, as, as a woman, for example, listen to the, to, to, to the current narrative, which is, you know, go out there, be, 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 you know, a big, bad, babe, boss, whatever it is, right? Do your thing. Go you, go you, go you. Yeah, man, more power to you, sis. And then all of a sudden, the brother's there, miskeen on the side, just like, you know, oh, cool, i got to live through this crap now. And wallahi, bro, that's, that's what we're living through. So... Sorry, bro. I, 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 just, I don't want to get too passionate about it. But, oh, you know what? Wallahi, like, as in, we are seeing an epidemic right now, and I feel not enough people are speaking about this unfiltered. And I feel like, bro, when people do have the courage to speak unapologetically and transparently about this, they're, they're being labeled, you know, shaming tactics like misogynist, bigoted, this phobe, that phobe, you know? I agree, bro. And, I, and, and you know what it is, bro? The, the problem here is that, and I always say this, I say this in some of my, my videos, right? is that the love online and the attention online, bro, it's all BS, bro. Like, you probably notice, I don't come, I don't reply to any comments at all. YouTube, Instagram, I don't reply to any comments. Because, bro, like, subhanAllah, like, I don't have time to go through this, number one. Number two, bro, everyone has an opinion. 
some random guy from Indonesia, bro. He's like, brother, this is not correct. And you're like, what, what? like, okay, cool, man. Like, you got your, that's fine. You say your piece, bro. But my job is to put the content out. Whoever it resonates with, alhamdulillah. If people don't like it, the unfollow button is there as well. You know? And I think we have to have more, 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 more mental strength when it comes to online, bro. I feel that a lot of youngsters are too attached to a like, a share, a reaction. Oh, someone speaking against? Bro, subhanallah, man. This is this is the online world, bro. Sadly, bro, we are we are becoming too fixated and attached to it, man. May Allah forgive us, man. Allahumma ameen. Allahumma ameen. And you, you'll find this trend. Like whenever, you know, something becomes popular socially, even in the non-Muslim world, that, that same thing tends to become popular within the Muslim world as well. And I'm not going to sit here and act like you don't have, you know, uh, men who harm their wives and daughters and oh, that yeah. stuff, right? Yeah. Like that exists 100%. But now we're falling into another extreme, which is instead of being a tyrant, be like like a servant slave, like would do whatever your wife wants. And not only is that harmful to the relationship, just like the reverse was, but that's harmful to her as a woman and you as a man, because a woman naturally does not want to be a leader a lot of the time. And a man naturally needs to be the leader, needs to feel like the man. And even like you'll have cases where like a woman... You know, she will she will cook it and clean for her husband after a long time. And she will say, like, I feel like a wife now. Now I feel like a woman. And you'll have a man who takes charge <clears throat> and takes care of things. And he'll be like, wow, I feel like a man. Like, this is just basic, yeah. normal stuff. But uh, Bro, you know, what, a lot what? of the non-Muslim world creeps in. Mm. Bro, let, me, let me jump in. Let me jump in real quick because I wanted to add this point. Because I feel like what we're saying is very true. But also, there are some people out here. You know, there are some people that take things a little bit out of context. And we should say that this doesn't mean don't help your wife whenever she does need some help. Because the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he helped his wife. He helped his wife. So, like, if, if we are not helping our wives, then what, what are we? Are we better than him? Of course not. So, it's like, again, this is for the people who are, you know, taking out of context. But I understand everything. You, it's, it's the extremism that's happening today. Where Same. the men are almost being forced to do the women's role and the women are being forced to do the, the men's role. But I just want to clarify that. No, no, no. You're, bro, you're 100% right, man. Everything is said with that disclaimer, bro. The, rea the reality is, bro, is when, when a narrative gains traction, it goes overboard naturally. That's just, that's just how it happens, bro. You know what I'm saying? They're, people don't know where to draw the boundary because you're, you're riding a wave and you don't know where to stop. And so the problem is, is that once something gains momentum, people don't know where the boundaries are because the boundaries are fresh. You know, you need to make the boundaries. And that's why I believe, and I respect you guys as well for speaking about this subject, because what you're trying to do, you're trying to bring those boundaries in. I say, okay, cool. Yeah, like there is abuse. Well, bro, without a shadow of doubt, there's abuse, bro. But, you know, speaking about that, that's fine. Raise awareness of that, no problem. But the reality is, is that we are now going to the other extreme as well, where basically we are, uh, you know, too shy and too, too nervous to speak about uh, the actual kind of like, you know, the divorce rates that we currently have. And listen, listen, don't get it twisted. Divorce did happen at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, but divorce then is not the same as the divorce today, culturally speaking. We have to be honest with ourselves. Yeah? Divorce then is not the same as divorce today. Divorce today, you know, subhanAllah for a sister, can ruin her. You know, and, 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 and that's the problem. And that's what we're trying to curb. Broken homes, bro. SubhanAllah, bro, there's a st crazy statistic, bro, is that like over 90% of, of, of inmates in prison are from broken homes. Why Why is that? It's because there's no stability. You need to have some a stable relationship. And so, like, as in a woman, as you said, Rami, like, she wants to feel like, you know, she's a, she's a wife. So, like, when your wife cooks for you, bro, be a man and, and compliment her. Praise her. When she cleans the room and she's like, you know, like, mashallah, can you see the room? Like, yeah, like, that's amazing. SubhanAllah, like, wow, thank you so much. I appreciate you. Like, don't be a lousy guy as well, man. That's the other thing as well, like, Brothers think that, this is the other thing, bro. Now what's happening, bro, now what's happening, especially with Andrew Tate and other few other people as well that are kind of pushing this, now what's happening is that it's the opposite as well. Slowly, we're on this trajectory now, bro. We're on this trajectory. And when that happens, people, again, because it's fresh, people don't know where to draw the boundaries, bro. And what this masculinity narrative does not mean is that you be a lousy husband, you be immature, you throw your socks out, like, you know, and don't pick them up, etc. You take care of yourself, man. Have responsibility. Have it for your own self, bro. I mean, imagine if people were to see, like, the way you behave, bro. Like, you know, how do you feel then? 
like I said, don't be, don't be lousy. Don't be, you know, at the end of the day, if she's struggling with something, help her, man. This poor woman left her home to come and live with you. You know what I mean, subhanAllah? So they, we have to, at the same time, be fair. But none of us are experts, man. So we're just trying to do our best to kind of help the youngsters, inshallah. And we're going to have flaws in us. We're going to have mistakes. And we just ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us for our errors and mistakes and for people to overlook them as well. You know, because at the end of the day, whatever narrative we push and whatever we promote and say as well, it always can be right and can be wrong. And as Imam Malik said, that the only person that is correct is the is the companion of this grave when he was speaking about the Prophet. So he's the only one that's infallible, bro. So at the end of the day, everyone else has flaws and can have mistakes as well, you know. So we ask Allah for, for assistance and guidance. I mean. Allahumma ameen. Allahumma ameen. And actually, that's that's a big point that I wanted to, to bring up as well. That's why it's so important, like fundamentally important for people to learn Islam. Because when they learn Islam, they learn what to do in situations. When you learn what to do in situations, you don't have to result to your own messed up psyche. That's going to tell you because you're you're traumatized for what happened 20 years ago. It's going to make yeah. you respond in this way. Like people don't understand like the amount of, of kids that were traumatized by their parents and not in the way some some in very horrible ways because the parents are just messed up. But some in very subtle ways, like the, the dad wasn't there enough. The dad didn't yeah. you know communicate with them enough for the mom was a little too sometimes she's there sometimes she's like disappearing you know those yeah. things create abandonment issues attachment issues you know even issues with with uh, developing love and and connections like all these things that break marriages in the future and it's me and my wife are talking about it. it's so easy to mess up a child even the mom like when, when it's a baby even like an infant and it's crying if you pick up your baby every single time it cries it may develop attachment issues yeah. Because every single time, even if it doesn't need anything, it just wants to be a brat, like a little baby brat and wants to cry because babies do that. If you yeah. pick it up, you're teaching it something that's bad. And if you never pick it up, obviously you're messing up your baby as well. So it's like, it's so easy to mess up a child. Imagine when you add to that oppression and tyranny and, and do this and do that and all these horrible things, you're messing people up. So when you take it back to the deen, you see how the Prophet was with his, with his grandchildren. You had a man who came to the Prophet and he saw him kiss his grandson on the forehead. He's like, you kiss your you kiss your grandkids? He's like, yeah. And the man's like, I have like 10 or 12 grandkids. I never kiss any of them. You know what the Prophet said? He said, whoever does not show mercy does not receive mercy. Meaning from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is so key as well. We have to be affectionate, bro. To our daughters especially. To our sons, yes, but to our daughters especially, bro. Because in today's world... Bro, there are strange men who will show affection to your daughter when she's older and she will run to that because she never received it from you. She has to feel a sense of love and belonging. And bro, especially in today's day and age, what we can't do is make the mistake of, yes, we love the traditional folk and the traditional values, etc. But we are living in a modern world. And we have to try and mold ourselves and adapt in a certain way to make sure that at the same time, when we do speak to our children and we do raise them, it's to understand and understand the culture that they live in. And it's to understand that you have to do things with subtleties. You have to be very careful. You have to try and do the right things as well. And wallahi, bro, you have to show love, kiss them, hug them, show them affection. Bro, wallahi, I say this here and I'm like, you know, it's not part of masculinity to not show your sensitive side bro you know you know my my brothers yeah they will i know they're all watching this right my friends in my community every single one of them have received a kiss on the cheek from me right why is that and subhanallah i don't do it because oh i'm just doing it i will like it because i love them I love them and I tell them that I love them for Allah's sake. And I genuinely do that, bro. And wallahi, if you're a da'i, this is, this is something that I've wanted to say for a while. If you're a da'i, if you spread Islam, if you and then you are someone that does not have compassion and love for people, you're doing the wrong job. If you do not have love and compassion and muhabba and genuine softness for your fellow man, for your fellow brother, why would you want to save them from the hellfire? What the hell, man? The whole purpose of da'wah is to save people from Jahannam. And that can only come and be born out of a genuine care. And that's why it's so important that when we are people that are online and du'a that are online, it's so important that you remove yourself from that and go and live with people. Just go sit in the masjid with your elders. Just sit in the masjid with the shabab. 
build something with them, have a vision with your local community because that is way more important than trying to build something online. Online, bro, you could just, it's cameras, lights, action, bro. It's cameras, lights, action, thumbnail, click, clickbait. That's all it is, really and truly, right? Yeah, everyone's fighting over that clout. But when it comes to, and to, to, to real life and the cameras are off, that's when you have to truly, you know, love people and build that connection. And obviously, you're just leading on from that whole masculinity kind of discussion is that when it comes to, when it comes to being a man, it doesn't mean you don't show emotion. It doesn't mean you don't show care. And it doesn't mean you don't show, you know, uh, mercy and tenderness towards your, your your brothers and your people. You have to have that, bro. Look at that. Our Prophet Alayhi Salaam, what did he say to Mu'adh ibn Jabal? When he was going to Yemen, he said, Ya Mu'adh, I love you. He walked with him to the outskirts of Medina. He said, Oh Mu'adh, I love you. Subhanallah, man. Like, you know, he's telling his companions that he loves them. Bro. If a man does this now, bro, or you look up, we we look him up and down, and be like, "Whoa, bro, you're right, yeah, you're okay." Like, and subhanAllah, that's why, bro. Like, we have to be examples as well, man. We have to show that love and care and tenderness as well, man. You know what I mean? Yeah, bro. I think I think that's beautiful, man. Um, I also think that it's crazy how if you get deep into Islam, you start to understand more of like what actual masculinity is. Uh, because before Islam, bro, I had such a twisted understanding of what masculinity was and i i feel like i had to kind of figure it out on my own but once i came to islam it's like wow it's it's so simple it, it's all been there from the beginning and then and like rami was saying like we do certain things and then as we do it we have this innate feeling like ah this feels right this feels like exactly how it should feel you know so alhamdulillah for that and um i gotta i gotta go guys i gotta go pray i'm so sorry i I'm so sorry, honestly. I didn't. I did not mean to come late today. Well, I. I hope you can forgive me for this. And, um, bro, I didn't even get your name. What's your name, bro? My name is Shaib. Shaib. Yeah, yeah. Like, like Shaib, the prophet. Shaib. Mashallah. You gonna you gonna give us all a kiss on the cheek when you see us? <laughs> I'm gonna kiss on the cheek, inshallah, man. Alhamdulillah, bro. Alhamdulillah, bro. I love y'all for the sake of Allah. Uh, may Allah accept all your praise and duas and assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh oh, subhanallah so um subhanallah bro honestly shay bro you, you reminded me of of it's like you unlocked a memory for me subhanallah when i was younger <clears throat> I, I had this like childhood friend he was a non-muslim but uh you know i was i was very close to me I, I consider him a really close friend um like i introduced him in a way to basketball and he he Became so good at it, honestly. He was better than me uh, very fast, you know, Allahumma barak. And um, yeah, that's how close this guy was to me. And I was at his house a lot of the time, you know, playing basketball and stuff. And one day I was outside his house on the porch with them. And my brother called me. I don't remember why, but I was in middle school, right? I was like grade seven or something, grade eight. And my brother calls me and we're talking. And at the end, he says, I love you, or I say, I love you, and something like that, you know, I love you, love you too, bye. And the guy looks at me, you know, he's a, he's a young white guy. He looks at me, he's like, you say you, you, you say I love you to your brother? And I'm like, I'm a young guy. I'm like, yeah, yeah. He's like, man, that's weird. I never said it since. I stopped saying it that day. Alhamdulillah, that. now recently I went back to it. And I'm, I'm upset that that kind of thing affected me that much. Dang. But I stopped saying it because of that, bro. And that, that honestly, that breaks my heart. Yeah, man, you know, wallahi, bro, when it comes to your brothers and the people that you're around, I I have to be honest with you, bro, there is a heightened sense of loneliness in the world today, bro, big time. And it's it's really playing on people, bro. Wallahi, bro, I'll tell you why. Two reasons, yeah? Social media creates the illusion that everyone's making moves. That everyone's going places, that everyone's progressing and doing stuff with their lives. Yeah. Because you have this, you have this small little window, right? And this window is what anyone gets to project onto you. But you don't see the real true picture that creates a void within, within your heart, thinking, I am incapable, I am lacking, I am falling behind, I am not doing the things that other people are doing. And then you also have this kind of uh innate desire to feel loved and a lot of the times bro parents are too busy working earning money you know especially fathers they don't have the time to show love to their children 
And I can say loads of things about my father and say how he, he didn't do this right, he didn't do that right, whatever. But one thing that my father always used to do was just stop, pause, and give us a kiss. Wallahi, I remember my dad, right, subhanAllah, yeah, like he used to just hug me sometimes and just kiss me. And he said, you know, you're the best thing that ever happened to me. And, and I would think to myself, wow, man, like subhanAllah, that, a, a man like my father, who's like proper macho or whatever, that like he can pause and he can do that. And that taught me, bro. And then I would go and do it to my friends and my brothers who are around me. And I can say, Wallahi, I can I can truly say this. Yeah, like I say this with chess, bro. Yeah. In the UK, I feel that what we have in our local town is the best brotherhood in the whole of the UK. And I, I well I truly, fully, fully believe that. Because we have brothers from London that come and see us and brothers from Birmingham, the two biggest cities in the UK. And they say, what you have here, we've never seen it anywhere else. We feel more love here than we do anywhere else. And the reason that is, bro, is because we, we, we make an emphasis to show each other love and care and talk to each other and spend time with each other. Everyone is important. No one is left behind. No one is sidelined. You know how what ends up happening is people create cliques in Islamic brotherhoods. They create cliques. There's like, you know, oh, me and my three friends, me and my four friends. And that's when things get a bit boring. The raqa'iq and the heart softness and the reminders get boring. And you four start to think, oh, is this Shaykh Salafi or what is he like? Is he this, is he that? Like, you know, and you get bored. Because let's be honest, that's, that's a subject that you have over like, you know, a cafe at late at night. Like, you know, your, your wives are at home, whatever. And you're there sat there thinking, oh, this brother gave a talk there, but his man had this and that. And you start picking, picking holes at people, right? We have a very conducive brotherhood that grows every single year, bro. It, wallahi, it grows to the point where we... We have way too many people to invite to events. We have way too many people. We can't fit them in the events now. And and subhanAllah, the reason that is the ethos that is the number one because of that one. Everyone is focused on spreading Islam, on, on, on getting the Islam through to the next generation. And number two, there is a genuine care and love for every single person. And there is a zero tolerance for bullying. Zero tolerance. Wallahi, bro, one time, yeah. In our gatherings, there was this one brother who, you know, nerds, bro, nerds, geeky, kind of like just like scrawny guy, skinny guy sitting in the corner, like, like kind of like that. He's there. He's in our gathering. He makes a joke and, and, and no one laughs. And some of the brothers, they take the mick out of him. And in the middle of this gathering, I say, brothers, I have to mention it to you guys right now. Wallahi, what you have done is poison. Yeah, you guys are comfortable because there's three, four of you here right now. And you guys are mocking him, right? He's trying to find some acceptance and love from you guys. And look at what you're doing. Wallahi, be ashamed, be, be ashamed of yourself. And I said that to brothers who are really close to me. And subhanAllah, like from their people learned the lesson that well, you can't backbite in this friendship group. You can't, you can't mock somebody in this friendship group. And this friendship group is all about love and progression and helping people and developing their iman. And if you go on like my TikTok and Instagram, you will see like videos of us around the campfire, etc. Having reminders and other videos and reminders and stuff like that as well. And like, subhanAllah, we try and create a very heart softening environment, man. There's always going to be flaws and problems with us. But, you know, subhanAllah, bro, I can say, truly say that, alhamdulillah, we have that. And I feel a lot of du'at, a lot of du'at should try and focus on this as well as their online da'wah as well. Because that, when you focus on that, when you truly focus on the ground reality, your Ikhlas develops more because you see people, you see the people that have been misguided, you see the people that are running towards the hellfire, and you see their problems, bro. You talk to them, you can feel them, hug them, bro. You can have that real conversation. And that's when you're able to think, why am I making this video? Why am I putting this reminder out? Why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? And you're like, subhanAllah, I want people to go to Jannah, man. I want people to enter paradise because I truly love people. And I say this to all my brothers and I say, your mission and aim in life is to get to paradise and take as many people as you can with you. That should be the aim. Nothing will ever trump that as a, as a vision and an aim. And, um, and wallahi bro, so for that reason bro, masculinity can be toxic if you don't understand it correctly. Look at the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Look at how he empowered his companions by telling them he loves them. And Wallahi, Amr ibn As, what did he say? The man who couldn't even look at the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he accepted Islam. Because 
to, before Islam, the Prophet was the most hated person in his eyes. And Amr said, he said that the Prophet was the most hated. Then he became the most beloved. And I, if you ask me to describe him, I would not be able to describe him because I didn't even look at his face. And he went to the Prophet and he thought he was the most beloved of the Prophet, companion of the Prophet and he said, Ya Rasulullah, who do you love the most? He said, Aisha. He said, amongst the men. He said, Abuha, so her father. Then he said, okay, okay, Abu Bakr, yeah, cool, I get it, I get it. Abu Bakr, your closest companion, he did hijrah with you, I get it. Okay, who next? Omar. Yeah, okay, cool, I get it, Omar. Then Uthman, then I, and then he, like, I stopped asking because I thought that, you know, I would never be, be mentioned. But to me, I felt he loved me the most. And wallahi, is that, is is he not our example, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? So that's what masculinity is, bro. Masculinity isn't just being macho and being like, yeah, man, let's work out. Let's do, like, let's let's do, like, fighting. Let's fight and let's grapple. And let's, let's beat people up and let's be, like, spread your shoulders. Wallahi, true masculinity is having care and love for your brother, but understanding your roles and responsibility as a man inside your home as well, man. And we're all full of flaws, bro. So maybe I've just waffled on and, all of this is Lord Ramesh, man. Allah <laughs> No, Allahumma bro. It's, it's beautifully said, mashallah. One, like 100%. And actually, it kind of touches on a point I wanted to mention as well. When it comes to, you know, manhood, masculinity, you know, what is a man? You have a lot of this discussion, like, what is a man supposed to be? You know, what defines a man? And I think it's such, it's, it's almost such a dumb question because it's like, subhanAllah, we've gotten so far from who we really are that we have to ask, you know, like, soon we're going to be asked, what is a human being? You know, because people don't identify as humans anymore. And that's going to become a mess as well, subhanAllah. But if you look at, you know, the Prophet ﷺ as the guideline for who is a man, you'll come to understand that uh, uh, basically a man is who he needs to be in the situation he's given. It depends yeah. on what situation you're in. If you're, you know, if, if someone's being attacked in that moment as a man, you need to go defend them. You need to be, you know, harsh. You need to be rough. You need to like beat this guy up, basically. Yeah. But if your daughter is coming, running, crying to you, you're not going to use that same energy with her. You're going to go, you're going to be compassionate, you're going to be, you know, protective, you're going to love her, you're going to have that compassion with her because she's your daughter. Or if your son comes crying, the same thing. It might be slight variations, slight differences, but it's going to be essentially the same compassion and love and, and mercy towards your children. You know, same thing with your wife. And subhanAllah, like, it's crazy, man. People pe people will be like, no, a man needs to be rough all the time. So he'll look at his son and be like, stop crying. Be a man. Grow up. It's like, bro, it, it, my wife was telling me this the other day when I was, when we were having this, this discussion. She was like, you know, be careful because you're still talking to a kid. We had different ideas, different ages in mind. I was thinking more like 11-year-old. She was thinking more like 4-year-old. But she's right. You're not going to go to a 4-year-old be like, be a man. You're, you're still talking to a kid. Well, like, And people need to understand that about masculinity, about being a man. Allah. 100 percent, bro. I, I I fully fully agree with you, bro. Wallahi, we have to truly understand that being a man isn't about just you know being harsh. You know, Subhanallah. You look at Umar Khattab and you see his personality, but do you know once he became a Khalifa, he was harder on himself than he was on anyone else, and he was only harsh because that was the only way he could really express his sincerity and love for Islam. And he was so careful about innovation and he was so careful about all these things that would misguide people, bro. And that's why he was harsh in those regards to defend Islam. But he wasn't harsh with the believers, bro. Wallah, he, he was so soft with the believers. He was so soft. There was a man, Awais al Qarni, who came from Yemen. And, uh, and you know, the Prophet spoke about Awais al Qarni and he mentioned that when Awais comes, you know, um, may ask him to make dua for you. And subhanAllah, because Awais al-Qarni, he was a wali of Allah. And subhanAllah, he came to Medina and, uh, and you know, he Awais al-Qarni was special. And Umar al-Khattab, he honored him. He loved him. He was so soft with him, bro. He gave him gifts. And subhanAllah, like, you know, anyone who is loved by Allah, anyone who's a believer, you should have that tenderness towards them. And that's why Allah says in the Quran, Adhillatin ala al-mu'mineen, right? Izzatin ala al-kafireen, right? You know, so you have Zilla, you have humility, you have this sense of tenderness with the believer, and this sense of strength in the eyes of the disbeliever, you know. And so this is why it's a, it's a sunnah that we've forgotten, bro. And that's why I feel that I feel that to draw the boundaries of masculinity will is, is definitely a challenge. And I'd encourage and urge you guys as well always to make sure to mention these things as well as mentioning, you know, what a real man is, you know, and again. You know, we all have mistakes, and we're all gonna, we're all going through this age of social media together, man. So, you know, this is all new to all of us, man. So we just ask a lot mm -hmm. to guide our path and 
and to keep us upright and straight. I mean, I mean, bro, I think this is a wonderful segue to kind of go into, you know, marriage and the whole structure and parenting and all that. To be honest, bro, how I found you was on my Explore page. There came this, this I think it was a reel that you posted going to Jemma with your with your daughter, right? It was like the first one you took your, your daughter to Jemma. And you were mentioning that, you know, recently you've changed and fine-tuned a little bit about your approach and delivery with your children and your daughter, namely. So do you want to go a little bit into that? Yeah, man, subhanAllah. So this is quite deep, bro. But basically with my son, with my son, uh, he was a little bit more spoiled because he was a first child, grandchild, great-grandchild for our whole family. He was the start of a new generation for everyone. He leveled everyone up, my son, right? So what ended up happening, he got a lot of attention. And I realized that and I sensed that he was getting a bit carried away. So there would be times that he's two years old and he's crying and I'd grab him and be like, Adam, stop this right now. And I'd shake him up a little bit, right? And he'd be like, <laughs> like, you know, he'd do that. And subhanAllah, like, that was tough love. And I would not do it often, but I did it sometimes. And he learned, bro. And he slowly started understanding that I can't get away with certain crap. I can't always just, you know, throw my toys out of the pram, like, you know. Um, and so then I was doing the same with my daughter. I locked the door and I just grabbed it. I said, Sumeya stop this now and subhanallah she kept on crying and just just get got worse and worse and worse and bro i'm telling you i was thinking that she's like my son but that's not the case bro and i don't know if this is the case for everyone like everyone's children is different the psyche is everyone different right this is just purely my experience subhanallah bro i started showing her more love more attention more care like subhanallah sometimes i'm editing or i'm working or whatever i'm doing and she'd come over and be like, Daddy, let's play catch. Or Daddy, let's feed Mariam. She's got a dog that's called Mariam. And I'd come with her and be like, okay, Mariam's like milk is rift, run out, go get the milk. And like, you know, we'd play and like we'd have fun and laugh and love. It's just silly, stupid things with my daughter, right? But subhanAllah, she loves that, bro. She absolutely she craves that. And my daughter never came up to me and gave me a hug until two months ago. And now she does it every single day. Because she sees that daddy is a safe space for me. That he's, he's tender-hearted with me. And I would excuse mistakes of my daughter more than I'd excuse mistakes of my son. And wallahi, bro, I realized that daughters need to be loved and taken care of and honored, bro. And really looked after. And subhanAllah, like, there's been certain sisters that have, have discussed it. And I've seen the discussion where they haven't felt love from their father. And that is one of the biggest mistakes and one of the biggest reasons that girls look for love elsewhere. And they become unstable and they have marriages that are unstable because they've never had love. And when love does come to them, they don't know how to manage it. And that's why if you show your daughter love from a young age, she will not crave it from other people. And that's why there may be things where you may need to scold her, but you excuse it for the benefit of just showing your daughter that love and that care. And I feel that's where subhanAllah for me, I realized that it's not about being heavy-handed. It's not about showing strength to your daughter. Wallahi, I realize that it's more about tenderness and gentleness and love and compassion when it comes to your daughter. And that's the biggest thing I learned, bro. And I'm glad I learned it. And she's only two years old. Um, because if I learned this later on, I know sometimes it can be too late, bro. And wallahi, sometimes once damage is done, it can be very hard to reverse. Because girls, they remember pain, bro. Girls, they remember the pain that they went through. And especially if they're a teenager, young teenager, wallahi, these are the most traumatizing. The, their body's changing. Everything's changed. So they, rem they associate so many emotions with this. And those emotions, if they are negative, they will harbor them. And it will be their anchor for the rest of their life, no matter how much you be good to them after that. And that's why it's so important that if you have young daughters, wallahi, my message to the fathers out there is to cherish them and love them and be compassionate with them and to know and look at the example of your Nabi. When Fatima came into the room, he would get up and he went forward and he kissed her on the forehead and he told her to sit next to him. You think you're a man by ignoring her? You think you're a man by being heavy handed, by telling her, hey, stop, you know what I mean? Just being a traditional old father? That's not how it works, man. And that's why it's so, so important to show your children that love, you know? We are flawed as human beings. The thing that we don't need is for our family to hate us. It's for our family not to love us. Because wallahi, that's one love that you need as a man. 
You need that love. And I did not know how much I needed my daughter's love until she gave it to me. Wallahi, bro. When she comes up to me and she said, Daddy, and hugs me and just grabs me. Akhi, I'm telling you, man. Bro, bro, bro. You don't understand. That love there, it replaces everything, bro. It replaces everything. It fills a void. And I didn't know. Me, I consider myself very mentally strong. But, bro, it filled a void in me that I didn't even know existed, bro. SubhanAllah, man. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Getting a bit deep here, man. But, yeah. You guys are both on me. I, I had you muted, bro. I got so much insight from that, that Instagram reel itself. And then just hearing, like, the backstory and everything going down with the context and the lessons learned and the wisdom, bro. It's it's, it's a game changer, man. And I don't have kids, too. Neither does Rami or Anhel yet. So, inshallah, it's, it's good to know these oh. things, you know, before having it. Inshallah, because, but at the end of the day, too, you don't want to get stuck into like paralysis by analysis. You know, parenting is also something that you learn as you go. There's only so much we can learn beforehand. Um, but in, in terms of to the husbands now, what advice would you have? Like things that you've really picked up on in like the last few years in your marriage? Okay, perfect. So, <clears throat> um, so I, I've been married before. I was married when I was 18 and the relationship didn't work out. And I got married from the UK. So I, I understand when and by the way it wasn't entirely her fault or my it, bro i take a big risk big chunk of that responsibility wallahi bro. massive chunk and um i and i'm not going to talk about her flaws but i'll speak about mine yeah the biggest flaws that i had as a man was number one i was broke bro i was broke you know i had a pink bicycle don't ask why it's pink right but i had a pink bicycle right and um and i'd go i'd go like you know and you know, go and we'd, we'd go together on that. Like, you know, like I'd be like just walking with my bike or whatever. Bro, like it was embarrassing, bro. Wallahi, man. You know what I mean? And um, and and I'm just being honest with you, bro. Like, as in when you don't have money, we don't have these things, bro. Really and truly, you can't truly be the man. And so, <clears throat> in essence, that was the thing that I said to myself. I will never, ever, 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 ever go back to that. What I don't care what happens, I'm never going to be broke again. The trauma that I had from that, bro, it stayed with me for the rest of my life. You know, and Alhamdulillah, bro, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed me to kind of never worry about money again. And that's the first thing, is that you have to try. If you want to be a man, if you want to stamp your authority, you need to be earning the bread, bro. Right? You need to be you need, you need to be getting the money, bro. And that's, that's very, very important. The second thing, bro, is when I give advice to young brothers, especially when they're looking for marriage and those who are married, you need to know your personality. You need to know what type of a character you are. How are you as a person? Are you someone that is strong-minded, opinionated, and basically likes the sound of their own voice and wants to be heard? And Or are you someone that's tender-hearted, goes with the flow, easy to get on with anyone, right? And I'm, I'm, the, I'm the former, right? I, I'm very opinionated, right? And I have kind of uh, natural leadership qualities that just overtake you at times. And so... I realized that if I want to marry someone, I need to marry someone that's tender hearted and shy, submissive, etc. And that is one of the main reasons why I got married from Pakistan. Because naturally, it's built in within them this element of servitude to the husband, this shyness to the husband, right? This humility towards the husband, this honoring the, the husband and the man of your, of, your, of your house. And so that's why the dynamic between me and my wife works. Allah knows best where it's going to end up and if it's going to be successful long term. But so far, so good. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect him from the evil eye and to, 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 to protect us from any type of fitna as well. I mean, but in essence, that's that you need to know who you are. And if you're a soft hearted person, then yeah, like as in, yeah, you know, your, your kind of restrictions on what you desire, what you want in terms of the personality of your wife are different. But as a man, generally speaking, most men have these qualities. Most men want to be heard. Most men want to be respected. Most men want to have the last say. And if you are of that type, if you are of that personality, then you need to know and realize what you're looking for in a wife and what you're looking for in a marriage and what you're looking for when you search for marriage. Because hot and hot together is just going to create a blaze. Cold and cold together is just going to give you frostbite. Hot and cold together will create the perfect temperature. And so the reality is, is that marriage is about stability and balance. You need to complement each other's weaknesses and strengths. And that's the first thing I'd say. And wallahi, the second thing, the most important thing, is never get marriage advice from just one person. 
speak to your elders and speak to those who have been in a successful marriage for over 20 years because they know better. And my advice is simply me projecting my own personal subjective opinion onto others. And hence why when I speak and when I say certain things, it's purely my own limited experience, which is totally flawed and full of biases and full of so many other things. So take it with a pinch of salt. Listen to other brothers, listen to other people. And when you are married and the brothers that are married, okay, I'll be honest with you, uh, when it comes to marriage advice, I'm not the best person to ask, purely because of the fact that, you know, I can be a lousy husband as well. But the biggest thing that I learned in marriage from my first failed one to mine one that's now currently, I'm, I'm married after that seven years, is maturity, bro. Maturity. Keep this shut at times. Not everything needs to be won. Not every argument needs to be won. Not everything needs to be fixed. Certain things, let them slide, let them go. I remember, bro, subhanAllah, man, like, as in, there were times when I first married, bro, when like, she drop a, she drop the face towel that I used to wash my face with, and like she'd use it on her dryer hair and drop it on the floor, and I'd be like, "What the hell? Like that's my face towel. I'm gonna get spots." And like, you need to know what you shouldn't argue about. You need to know what to just slide, bro. Just slide. Women, right? Women love drama. Women will get into drama so easily, bro. Yeah, but the reality is, you need to know and be mature enough to know what battles you need to win and what battles you don't need to win. And most of them you don't need to win. And most of them you don't need to get into. And most of them can be avoided, bro. Wallahi, sometimes I'll be arguing with my wife and then I'm thinking, why? How did this, I didn't even get here? How did this argument even start? <laughs> and wallahi, like, I forgot my point. And then I just, oh, sorry, I'm sorry. Like, you know what I mean? And so the reality is, bro, is that you need to have the wisdom and the maturity to understand that you're not going to get everything right. And that's why it's important to learn on the job. And to get advice and be amongst people who are elder than you, older than you. Wallahi. Subhanallah, man. I don't care who hates this advice, but you need to have elder murabbis. You need to have elder people around you to help you. Trust me. To navigate through this journey of life. You're only 21, 22, 23, 24, whatever. This is fresh, bro. No one an expert. Not me, none of us. So have your elders. What is the saying that the Salaf used to say? Kunu ma akhabidikum. That be with your elders. I can't remember the exact saying in Arabic, but be with your elders, be with your mashayikh, be with the elders. Because they have lived through what you have lived through. And they have wisdom that cannot be taught. You may have followers. Okay, I've got followers, bro. I've got followers. I've got whatever you want to call it, right? I've, I've, got, I've got an opinion. I don't have wisdom. I don't have age on my side. And that's why it's so important that when it does come to marriage advice, you take it from the elders. You take it from people who have been there, been successful. And don't take it from young people who are inexperienced. And this is why I like to sometimes police the conversations of my younger brothers, my friends. When they start getting a bit carried away, like, bro, yeah, man, that girl, bro. I'm like, boys, relax a little bit, yeah? Like, you lot are just getting carried away with certain things, yeah? And I sometimes like to police that because sometimes they need to know as well that it's not all a bed of roses once you get married. And I just made a, a video the other day as well about that. You know, I said, well, like, once you smell their farts, man, all those dreams are gone. Bro, all those dreams are gone. That's it. You know, that, 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 that fantasy picture that you've got, that romantic idea of love. Yeah, have that. But bro, that's not what be all and end all of marriage. And once the ideas and the fantasies die out, you're thinking, this is dry, man. Well, I've got to actually talk to this person. You've got to create conversation, you know. And that's why, subhanAllah, like, I feel that it's important to have the right expectations going into marriage. And once you are married, always have the right people around you to give you good positive advice as well. And if there are any sisters listening, my biggest advice to you, sisters, wallahi, biggest advice to you, if you are a young sister and you are trying to get married or you are married, have elder sisters, senior. I'm not talking 25, 24, 27, who have just like been married two, three years, where I've got one child, and you know, they're like, you know, posting pictures on Instagram. I'm not talking about them. I'm talking the elder sisters in the community, 35 plus, 40 plus, four, five kids, etc. The kids are like, you know, teenagers. Ask them, what should I do? Because wallahi, the advice will always come back, honor your husband. 
honor your husband, respect your husband, be there for him, etc. And they will tell you when abuse and tolerance is getting too much. If you are getting abused, if you are getting bullied, if you are having problems in your marriage, they will be the ones who tell you, don't listen to his young sister who if your husband says, I want you to clean for me. How? Abuse, man. Ah, toxic husband, blah, blah, blah. You get an abuse sister. No. That's, that's not what you, those aren't the right friends you need to be around. Be with the elders, bro. Wallahi, that's that's my biggest advice. Because I can't really give marriage advice, bro, because I'm still learning on the job right now, man. So forgive me for not giving you a complete answer, but that's generally what I would say. Habibi, Jazakallah khair. That was sufficient enough. I do want to zero in now on one of the final topics before we do wrap up, unless Rami has anything else. You you mentioned the importance and, and how pivotal it is to, to make bread and to have money not be reliant or dependent on something because money at the end of the day money isn't the end all be all but it is a means to not sacrifice your honor and integrity to have the ability to travel do whatever you want to do live life on a little bit more on your your own terms and with that responsibility if you do it right you can come close to a lot so how did you get to this point at what point would you have and i want to give a disclaimer guys it's not financial advice we don't want any lawsuits or anything like that but what advice would you have when it comes to money perfect bro so a lot of people don't know this and I guess maybe I've been a bit quiet about this because I don't like to speak about my financial things, mainly because of tax man, but also at the same time, right, you know, when it comes to online, there's a lot of hassle and stuff like that as well. But seeing as obviously um, you guys have asked me, uh, Alhamdulillah bro, Allah, Allah has blessed me to, to, to earn six figures and be in a position where I've kind of, uh, Alhamdulillah, had the, had the pleasure of earning a good amount of money you know alhamdulillah bro and i'm still strengthening these uh, income streams as we go along um and so i've realized something bro and that is that you know firstly if you want respect from your woman if you want respect for your wife as you said freedom to travel live life in your own terms etc you need to be earning money you need to be earning money and i didn't have i don't have a degree neither do i have any kind of massive qualifications or skills or anything like that so i've learned hustle from the down up and my advice when it comes to money, bro, and, I, and Alhamdulillah, like, you know, I, I give this advice to my younger brothers, is not to depend on one source of income. That's the first thing in this world. Not to depend on one source of income. Diversify your income. And what you should do is experiment with different hustles. What you need to do is this is one of the biggest advice I'd give. Put aside two, three hundred pounds, right, every single month. And that, you do not touch that money. That money is experiment money. And you do not have an emotional attachment to that money. That money, it will simply be to experiment different hustles with. And what you do with that, once you save up and you try and, and then what you do, you see if a hustle works. You see if a business works. You see if this happens. Ever. And you may go through 10 different opportunities and the 11 one will strike. And then you use that and then you start scaling that one. You start growing that one. That's how you do it. And Alhamdulillah, bro, I have about five, six businesses right now. I'm just opening my sixth one up now. Uh, it's a smokehouse, uh, like Texas barbecue smokehouse kind of thing. Um, and, uh, and, and bro, like, as in fun, like, you know, um, and this is, this is something like, you know, I remember, you guys know SQ, right? You guys know SQ, right? So, so um, SQ, is like, you know, he does hijama, he does, he sells zamzam, etc. And, uh, you know, subhanAllah, I, SQ's wife lives, uh, she's like my neighbor, pretty much in the UK. Uh, so it was me who taught SQ how to do hijama, right? And like helping him on that journey, etc. I said to him, like, bro, you got to just just try to just, just do it, bro. And so I look at SQ, he's got so many followers, he's got like, you know, someone that subscribes on YouTube, but he's doing hijama, he's doing this hustle. He gets it, bro. He gets it. You know, you shouldn't be embarrassed, bro, to do certain things. And so... I did a few things and hijama popped for me. So now I'm just starting to scale that. I I, I try diff selling different things and zamzam and ajwa dates, etc. I do that in Ramadan. I make you know good money in Ramadan. I, I I go all out in that in that small period of time and that keeps me running for a couple of months. Then I've got my, my other kind of you know uh, hajj and umrah that I do as well uh, with with a few brothers as well. Alhamdulillah, I've got a kind of a share in that as well. And you know that works. You 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 work hard at your hustle. You do it. But bro, it's not going to be easy. When I was in 2016, bro, I was um, I was driving a banged up micro, bro. I was driving a banged up micro. I had no money. I I was just starting out, bro. And and then subhanAllah, as you grow older, like people will see me now with like alhamdulillah, like a nice Range Rover or a nice car, or whatever, etc. But they don't understand that where you are is where you are. Don't compare yourself to other people. Run your own race. You are on your own journey, your own track. Get your head down and focus. And also. Also, also, once you start your hustles, 
never ever spend more than your own lifestyle live within your means one of the biggest problems that youngsters have is they'll, 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 they'll start a business and get hustle and they don't have enough money to restock or they don't have enough because they're spending that money the worst thing you can do in your 20s is buy an expensive car the worst thing and you need to understand this is this is like you know financial education is so important liabilities and assets and i'll recommend the book rich dad poor dad to people where basically you understand anything that is taking money out of your bank account well, you know what? I, I didn't understand how simple this is, but a lot of people just don't understand it. Lower your liabilities, lower your outgoings and increase your assets. Increase your assets. And don't feel like you need to live the life of a millennial entrepreneur right now. Build for the future. So, for example, right now, I've got a, 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 a like real estate like portfolio with different properties, etc. in different countries. But bro, it's, it's, it's stripping me dry every month, bro. I'm paying money every month. And sometimes my wife, she may not even understand. She's like, why are you doing that for? Why don't you just save money right now? I said, I'm not saving money right now. What good is me saving money right now when I can put money in an investment that's going to reap the rewards when I'm 32, 33, 34. And then I've got, you know, four or five properties to my name. I've got this and that. I've got so many different things. You need to build your asset library. Build your asset library to the extent where, inshallah, it comes to a point where month on month you're making five, six, seven, eight thousand pounds. And don't feel entitled to anything. No one owes you a penny, bro. No one owes you anything. You have to go out. And it's 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 basically dog eat dog. And it and that's how you have to understand it. Don't cut anyone up, don't be unjust in your business, but go out there and hustle as hard as you can and try and try and find businesses that you think work and make them better and scale them up. And that would be my advice to people. I've got so much more to say, but I'm obviously conscious of time. But Wallahi, this is something that you have to, as a man, focus on, especially in the demands of the West. You can't be broke, man. It's, it's, it's tough, bro. Wallahi, bro. It's tough, man. And you know what, bro? I'll just be real with you, bro. The brothers that promote this broke lifestyle, you know, it's, it's, it's tough being broke. And it's tough being wealthy you choose your tough and a caveat a, a small disclaimer by me saying this does not by any means mean at all whatsoever in any way shape or form that brothers who are poor who don't have money right should not be respected wallahi bro you may have the wali of allah you may have the friends of allah who are poor the Prophet ﷺ lived as a poor man. And therefore, we should not glorify the life of an entrepreneur and all these things, bro. We shouldn't glorify and put people down who are broke and who don't have money. Because certain people, they can't be entrepreneurs. And certain people are comfortable in their jobs. And that's absolutely fine. And I generally find the people who are telling people, you need more money, you need more money. Eventually, they're trying to sell you a course. And this is generally kind of how it is. And I've seen it over the years. And I'm seeing a big trend now as well. And what I would generally say is run your own rate. Don't look left. Don't look right. And focus, 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 focus. And give one thing attention at a time. Don't try doing too many things at the same time as well. And lastly, remember that it's not money that will make you happy. Rather, it's a contentment of the heart, the richness of the heart, the closeness and that intimate relationship with Allah Azza wa Jal, that is what will give you that true contentment and richness of the heart. And you may be broken, you may struggle and you may have so many problems your whole life, but that may be your way to Jannah. The way to Jannah for certain people like Uthman and Abdurrahman and Auf and other people was to donate and was to help and Muslims who are in position of leadership should strive to be wealthy. That was their way to get to paradise. Your way may be the way of Abu Huraira, Salman al-Farsi, whoever, who are poor, who don't have that much money, right? Your test is your test. Don't worry. If you can't, if you're trying to make hustle, if you're trying to make bread and you can't get to the way you want to get to, that's okay. That's fine. And the people that brothers that are wealthy, wallahi, shame on you if you only spend time with the elite and the wealthy. Shame on you. Be with your brothers, especially if you're a da'i. Especially if you're giving da'wah, do not be with the elite. Even religious elite, don't always spend time with them. Be with the common folk. Be with the people on the ground. Be with the uncle in the masjid. Have the humility throughout your whole life because that is what will keep you grounded and that is what we all need in our lives as well. Wallahu ta'ala.
100%. And people might be wondering, what am I looking down at for the last 10 minutes? I was trying to find an ayah in the Quran. I, want, I found one. I wanted to find the second one. Just to back up what Brother Shuhayb is saying. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says in Surah Zumar, and I'm going to read the translation here. But he says, when one is touched with hardship, they cry out to us alone. Then when we, sh when we shower our blessings upon them, they say, I have been granted all this only because of my knowledge. Allah says, not at all. It is no more than a test. Allah is saying, Allah is saying, and he says this, he's saying it about both, but he specifically after he says, when we shower them with blessings, it's no more than a test. Meaning if you are rich, you're being tested. And if you are poor, you're being tested. Same thing in Surah Al-Fajr. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, when we basically... When we, when we uh, increase our servant in, in risk and in provisions, he says, my Lord has honored me, right? Uh, actually, Allah says, when we test our servant and increase him in the risk, he says, my Lord has honored me. And when we test him and we restrict his risk, he says, my Lord has humiliated me. But what's the point that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in both cases is testing you? So we're going to, you know, live life with this test, you know? Are we going to work towards, you know, living a uh, a life where we can benefit other people and, and, you know, have money and wealth and abundance, which Muslims should have, inshallah? Or are we going to sit and be like, you know, I don't want any of the dunya, so I'm just going to sit on my hands and wait till I decay, you know? Especially living in the West where you have so many opportunities and the online world right now, bro, we should take advantage of, inshallah, man. But Zakhla guys, for having me, man. Wallahi, I, I really appreciate you guys have me on here. I feel like I've spoken way too much, man. So forgive me, bro. I don't I don't normally do like this sort of stuff. So inshallah, it's all new to me as well. And uh, inshallah, hopefully we can maybe do another one sometime soon. But I really appreciate the invitation. And thank you for honoring these, man. May Allah bless you guys. I love you for Allah's sake. Habib, may Allah love you for loving us for our sake. Allahumma barak. It was a pleasure having you on. You didn't talk too much. Don't worry. Um, <laughs> you only talk too much about talking too much. So don't worry, Habib. Uh, may Allah elevate you. Fire, bro. Any last thoughts bro when we come to the uk inshallah in a few months we gotta meet up and, and do some wow 100 percent, man you you gotta come check out some of our events as well man we'd love to, to, to host you guys inshallah inshallah exactly okay. may Allah bless you yeah. keep you elevated and progressing at the rate that you're progressing at if not even yeah. faster and I mean, uh, allow you to reach more hearts i mean thank you my I mean, bro. Rabbi Rabbi Rabbi. Rabbi. Allahumma ameen. And thank you all for watching. Jazakallah khair. May Allah elevate you all immensely. One thing I want to share before we end. When you see someone else is blessed with something, uh, it's not from the sunnah to say, mashallah. It's actually from the sunnah to say something like, Allahumma barak. May Allah put blessings in it for you. So it's, we see, and I, was, I kept saying it throughout the whole stream, and I want to share it with you guys because I feel like nobody knows this, unfortunately. Don't say, mashallah, unless you're talking about yourself. If Allah blesses you with a good spouse, say, mashallah, towards yourself. And when you see someone, you know, Allah bless someone else, say Allahumma barak. So Allahumma barak to brother, Shuhayb, mashallah, he created two sides, the movie. Go check out the trailer. It's on YouTube and watch the movie, inshallah, whenever you get the chance. And with that being said, Allahumma atina fid dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina adhab in nar. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum